major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, proud to support the mission of KPBS and privileged to serve San Diego clients. Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, helping homeowners maintain drain, heating and cooling systems since 1978. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening. It's Friday, November 12th. Thanks for joining us. I'm Amitha Sharma in for Mayo Chibulsi. Tonight, there's still no new labor agreement between Kaiser Permanente and more than 20,000 Southern California health care workers. KPBS health reporter Matt Hoffman says nurses and others are preparing to walk out in just a few days. We feel like Kaiser has given us no other option, and this is our last hand in the deck. If a deal can't be reached by this weekend, then thousands of Southern California Kaiser nurses, pharmacists, and other health care workers will go on strike, and that's including about a thousand of those health care workers right here in Kearney Mesa. Maybe it'll come to the final hour, which is great. Great. If we can avert a strike, that would be wonderful. But our nurses are prepared to do whatever it takes. Nikki Avey has been a registered nurse at Kaiser for 16 years. She's also a union officer for the San Diego area and says if there's no agreement, the strike will start at 7 a.m. on Monday, just as the night shift is getting off. The nurses are ready. Um, they have been ready for quite some time now. Kaiser is offering up to 4% annual wage increases over the next few years with no change in benefits. But the union says they are really offering 2% raises with annual bonuses. Their math doesn't really equal what our math equals. <laughs> Also, a major point of contention is Kaiser's proposal to pay new health care workers less than existing ones. The union calls it a two-tier pay system that would divide employees. We are not budging on that. We will not accept a two-tier wage system. Um, it is very divisive. In a statement, Kaiser says that bargaining teams have been meeting around the clock and feel they are on a path toward an agreement that meets the shared interests and would avoid unnecessary and harmful disruptions to care. The union says they are doing this to help keep attracting top health care workers to provide the best patient care. The planned strike has no end date, and Kaiser officials say they have contingency plans to continue care should workers walk out. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. Former Trump advisor Steve Bannon has been indicted by a grand jury for contempt of Congress. The House January 6th committee subpoenaed documents and testimony from Bannon last month. The Justice Department said today Bannon was charged with two counts, one for refusing to appear for a deposition and the other for refusing to turn over documents. Each count carries a minimum of 30 days and a max of one year in jail. San Diego Unified School District officials say attendance was at about 48 percent today. Students had the option of going to school or not. There was plenty of confusion following the district's original plan to cancel classes for a mental health day and then reversing the decision. KPBS education reporter M.G. Perez has been following the controversy. I write with my right hand. Ten-year-old Ava Gray is ready and willing to take a COVID-19 vaccine shot just so long it's in her left arm. It kills the virus, so I don't, I, I don't have to get COVID. I can fight it. Nice long weekend, huh? Ava did not go to school today and instead came with her mother to the San Diego Unified School District Education Center. So did many other children and adults to get their first or single dose of a COVID vaccine. Nurses from UC San Diego in a mobile truck put shots in arms consistently throughout the day. Attending school was optional today in the district. We decided to take a mental health day. Ava's mom is one parent who welcomed the option to take the day off. So I took the day off myself, and uh, so I think it's important, important to have that quality time together and, and, you know, and explain what we're doing here and why. Last week, the district planned to cancel classes. Then the interim superintendent pulled the plan after many parents objected to the late notice. Board of Education members took heat for the confusion and lack of transparency, too. We made a mistake. Board President Richard Barrera hopes this optional day worked out for the best, giving parents time to either get students vaccinated or send their children to school for learning. 
The mobile UCSD vaccination van is just getting started on a mission to vaccinate anyone five and up. Today will be a good day for the students who are at school. It'll be a good day for students, you know, who are, who are taking the day off. We'll get through this and um, yeah, and we'll do a little bit better job going forward in terms of being clear. Taking COVID-19 vaccines on the road started here at Monroe Clark Middle School in City Heights Wednesday afternoon. In just three hours, more than 200 people were vaccinated. District officials hope to keep that momentum going in other under vaccinated communities. Mann Middle School is on the list for a visit from the vaccine van next week. Today, it was hard to find anyone on campus. That was also the case at other schools we checked with. And a small poke. Ava Gray got her shot and will return to school Monday. Like many people who've been vaccinated, she says she feels a little sore and a lot safer now. You high five. That's a good job. MG Perez, KPBS News. All fully vaccinated adults in California who want a booster shot should be able to get one. That's the word from California Department of Public Health officials. They ordered doctors not to turn away adult patients seeking boosters, opening up eligibility to millions of people across the state. Dr. Davy Smith, an infectious disease specialist at UC San Diego Health, says it could help as healthcare providers expect a spike in cases this winter. I mean, more people uh, better vaccinated as, as one might expect with a booster should help. I, now that's important, but I actually think we're still lagging behind uh, people not getting their first series of vaccination. And I think that is actually gonna be more important. Dr. Smith recommends talking with your primary care doctor to determine whether you should receive a booster shot. With younger children now eligible for vaccines, this is a good time to remind you about the Tracking COVID-19 section at kpbs.org. We have details on vaccine locations and all of our local reporting on the pandemic. From the homepage, find the drop-down next to the news section and click Tracking COVID-19. The pandemic turned the restaurant business upside down, and now it's struggling with inflated food prices. KPBS reporter Melissa May describes how food suppliers and a local restaurant group are coping with the higher prices. Specialty Produce is one of the largest food service and fresh produce suppliers in San Diego. Prices are always gonna go up. Uh, we have to find innovative ways to be more productive, increase productivity of people working for you better cooperation with your vendors and your customers. So all this, we always do work as a team in, the, in this industry. Bob Harrington is the owner of Specialty Produce and says the fuel prices to run his fleet of over 70 distribution trucks is one of his biggest expenses, along with the price of getting the products to his actual warehouse. The cost of that truck for that four or five day period has gone up pretty dramatically, 30, 40%. So it adds a lot of cost to the, uh, to the product itself. Harrington is used to inflation. I've never seen a time in the 40 years I've done this that there hasn't been inflation. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. I used to sell, in 1977, I sold avocados for 11 cents each. So I think since 1977, how many times have avocados gone up in price? Specialty produce sells and distributes supplies to over 1,000 restaurants each week, including those that are a part of the Trust Restaurant Group figuring out ways to, to make money off of the things that you may not have made money on in before. That's Brad Wise, chef owner of Trust Restaurant Group. Besides operating five restaurants throughout San Diego, they own a butcher shop and a catering company. Rising food prices have forced his business to get creative. Zero waste goes into it too. We make sure that, that every piece of, of every item is being used, you know, and, and, you know, if it's the fat trim, it's being, you know, on this steak or at the butcher shop. It's being rendered down, put into butter that is for sale. So we've, we've, when your back is up against a wall, that's usually when you're the most creative. Wise tries to make sure the higher food costs do not significantly increase prices for his guests. I'll go to a product that may be a little bit smarter, buy in bulk and things like that. So although I've been, you know, extremely hit by this, 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 this kind of trend that's happening now. Um, you know, we're just trying to be as agile and as smart as we can on everything. Why says customers have been understanding of higher food bills and inflation is not going to stop his restaurants from providing a place for the community to gather and eat. 
this industry can't go anywhere, especially in San Diego. So it's it's just let's just keep pushing forward one foot in front of the next and keep rolling. It'll get better, hopefully. Melissa May, KPBS News. The VA San Diego Healthcare System celebrated the grand opening of its new outpatient center in Kearney Mesa. KPBS reporter Alessandra Rangel has more on the new services the clinic will provide. I served 20 years and I retired. Elizabeth Robertson is a U.S. Navy veteran. It was her first time at the VA Kearney Mesa Outpatient Center. Although she got lost as she made her way through the big new building, she was amazed to be treated at such a nice facility. It means a lot to veterans, yeah. a bigger place uh, to room around, check out or what services we have here. The $50 million facility is twice the size of the Mission Valley VA clinic it replaces. Robert Smith, a director with the VA San Diego Healthcare System, says the clinic will provide service to at least 600 veterans daily. I think that today represents a continuation of our Veterans Day events and marks an important expansion in our ability to provide world-class care to the veterans that we serve. Congresswoman Sarah Jacobs says this center will help with detailed care that in the past was overlooked. We recognize now in 2021 that the health care needs of veterans are so much more complex and different than how they were understood when the VA was first founded. On top of primary care services like eye care and mental health, veterans will have access to dozens of services. The building will house more than 30 outpatient services with additions such as dental, dermatology, GI, orthopedics, pain, podiatry, prosthetics, sleep, urology, the VA San Diego Healthcare System serves more than 80,000 veterans in the San Diego and Imperial counties. Alexandra Rangel, KPBS News. The Salk Institute is getting its biggest single donation ever. Up to $100 million from philanthropist Joan and Irwin Jacobs. KPBS reporter Kitty Alvarado tells us what it means for the Institute. It's a big day at the Salk Institute. Philanthropists Joan and Erwin Jacobs are giving the Science and Research Center up to $100 million, making it Salk's largest single donation to date. The Institute's chief science officer says this donation is transformative. 50 years from now, people will look back at this moment and recognize this as a significant moment in our history. This is a long lasting legacy and we are eternally grateful. This will go towards building a $500 million science and technology center that will be named after the Jacobs. We're just very excited about the plans for the new building, the work that's going to go on in that new building, and so we want to make sure that it will happen and happen fast enough to really make a difference both to Salt, but also to the entire city. Erwin Jacobs is the founder and former CEO of Qualcomm. As an engineer by trade, science is important to him and contributing to the center that will benefit many means everything. Well, that, of course, is always a motivation for all of us. How can we help many people, most of whom we'll never know, but how can we help them have a more successful, more healthy life? And so supporting the science here is an important aspect of that. The donation is being made on a matching basis. For every $2 Salk raises, the Jacobs will give $1 up to $100 million, making it a community effort. I hope it will set an example. For me, that's the most important part of our giving is that other people will realize that it's an important thing to do and to set an example for them and for our children. The Institute was founded 60 years ago by the polio pioneer Jonas Salk. Hetzer says this gift means more scientists can work towards curing diseases like cancer and preventing the next illness yet to be discovered. He wants everyone to be a part of that. Everyone is welcome to join. Whatever they can contribute, it makes a difference. It can fund uh, important projects that drive science further, but also to training of the next generation of scientists. Kitty Alvarado, KPBS News. Full disclosure, Joan and Urban Jacobs are also supporters of KPBS. California continues to lead the nation when it comes to coastal policies that account for imminent climate change impacts. KPBS environment reporter Eric Anderson has details from the latest Surfrider Foundation State of the Beach report. California gets a nearly perfect report card. The state has 1,100 miles of coastline that range from rocky cliffs 
to wide beaches. And the coastal zone is already feeling the impact of a warming climate with sea level rise and storms putting pressure on the region. The climate crisis is bearing down on us. And just this past year, we've seen you know, tremendous amounts of extreme weather events, um, an unfortunate um, problem. So really, it comes down to being more proactive. Seekich Quinn says the Surfrider report gave California top marks for dealing with sediment management, development, and sea level rise. How the state manages seawalls was only rated OK, saying California's habit of approving emergency seawall projects is short-sighted. The report credits the state's legislature, governor, and coastal commission for doing the right thing. So it is the progressive nature of those three different entities that are constantly propelling California forward um, so that we manage our coastlines properly. California's coast generates billions of dollars in economic activity and helps create businesses that hire tens of thousands of people. Seekich Quinn says protecting the economic engine is critical. Eric Anderson, KPBS News. Today was another hot, dry, and gusty day across much of Southern California as Santa Ana's sweep through. And it looks like we could be in for more of the same, but a cool down is in sight. Marvin Gomez has your forecast. Happy Friday and thanks for tuning in to KPBS News. I'm Marvin Gomez with your AccuWeather forecast. High pressure still under control and that means abundant sunshine across our area. We're going to be tracking that offshore flow, dry conditions for us. And of course, those temperatures, they're going to stay above average for our area. And eventually into early next week, that's when we will start noticing some changes with onshore flow returning and a cool down for many areas. So let's talk about tonight's forecast here in San Diego County, Ramona 52 degrees, Borrego Springs into the upper 50s, Mount Laguna, the higher terrain into the low 50s as well. As we transition into our weekend, well, high pressure will continue to be in control, like I said, so that means that most of the region is going to stay warm. The only areas that are going to experience cooler conditions along the coast will be the northern half of the state. Uh, obviously, us here in San Diego County, we're going to stay nice and quiet as we head into our weekend. Abundant sunshine for Borrego Springs, 89 degrees there during the afternoon, mid-60s for Mount Laguna along the coast. San Diego, 89 degrees. Oceanside getting a little bit warmer to 80 degrees for the afternoon. Let's talk about that extended forecast. Temperatures gradually diminishing, especially into early next week. 76 for our high on Monday, and eventually we're back in the 60s for Tuesday and Wednesday of next week. Inland areas, you're also experiencing the cool down. Upper 80s for Saturday afternoon potentially 90 degrees on Sunday and we're back in the 70 territory for Tuesday and Wednesday in the mountains abundant sunshine clouds eventually come our way into the middle of next week and along the deserts not a lot of changes for us on our end we are staying into the upper 80s to low 90s for the rest of the weekend and also into early next week probably by Wednesday that's when we might see some low 80s across our area. I'm Marvin Gomez with your KPBS forecast. Every year, millions of tons of plastic end up in landfills. Now, a Bay Area startup says it's found a way to turn discarded plastic into something stronger. Reporter David Louie shows us how. Many of us recycle paper, plastic, bottles, and cans. It's a commitment many of us make to be good environmental stewards. However, you may be surprised to hear this. Most of the time in America, it is not getting recycled. It is going to landfills uh, where, you know, it ends up it ends up being buried. Miranda Wang is co-founder and CEO of Novo Loop in Menlo Park. She's referring to plastic. Specific examples of non-recyclable plastic include shampoo bottles, shipping mailers, bubble wrap, and tarps. Novo Loop has developed technology it says can turn them into something better. She calls it upcycling. We put the plastic into a sequence of chemical reactions that first break down the plastic into chemical building blocks. These chemical building blocks sort of look like, look like a white powder, like a little bit like table salt. From that, it creates a proprietary material called Oystra, a thermoplastic polyurethane, which is stronger than the original plastic. Oystra can be used for the soles of running shoes, for cable shielding, and even for auto components. It addresses the dumping of plastics that Miranda Wang says can take tens of thousands of years to decompose. 
we're leading an entire uh, new era where society can look, look at waste and say, hey, you know, that's not waste. That can become a shoe. That can become a car and, and come up with all of these different ways we can use this material and keep it in play. The challenge is mounting as over 330 million tons of plastics are produced each year. Less than 9% of it is recycled. It could take decades for processes developed by Novo Loop and others to scale up. Venture capitalists are betting on these advances in recycling. Novo Loop has raised $10 million to continue its research and development since it was founded six years ago. I'm Judy Woodruff. Tonight on the News Hour Tipping Point, negotiators race to reach a deal at the UN Global Climate Summit. Coming up at 7 after Evening Edition on KPBS. People across the U.S. have been quitting their jobs in record numbers. Today, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported that 4.4 million people quit their jobs in September. That's a new all-time high. The most resigned jobs were ones where employees have to work mostly in person. They were also relatively low paying. Also, nearly 10.5 million positions were reported open in September. That means workers were more empowered to pick and choose jobs. Inflation numbers were released for October, and inflation is at 6.2 percent. That's the highest since 1990. SDSU's Miro Kopik weighs in about how this could impact holiday shopping in the Friday Business Report. What we're seeing in, the, in inflation, it's across the board, across a lot of uh, uh, core staples. So when we look at uh, grocery prices, they're up a five and a half percent in the grocery store. Uh, meats, uh, bacon, um, prime rib are up over 20 percent. Uh, gas prices are up substantially. Um, you know, nearly double last year on the national average perspective. Uh, energy. Uh, appliances, electronics, toys, everything that we're going to be buying for Christmas, all in time for the holiday shopping uh, time frame. However, the National uh, Retail Federation really believes that consumer spending is going to increase substantially uh, on the order of 8 to 10 percent versus last year. Um, this is a huge number. Normally, uh, over the last 20 years, those, those increases in spending for holiday shopping have ranged between three and five, five and a half percent. So we're talking nearly double the amount of spend uh, increase versus an average year when we haven't had a, um, a major economic disruption uh, in, in, uh, to contend with. Another downside to inflation, you can expect to pay a little more for your Thanksgiving dinner this year. The cost of the annual holiday meal is expected to rise about 3 to 4 percent. Analysts say bird prices, turkeys in particular, have been flying upward recently. The USDA says frozen turkey prices are up 22 percent from last year. The cost increases are also being blamed on a drop in production. People who celebrate Christmas usually think about trimming the turkey before trimming the tree. But you may want to act faster this holiday season. Christmas tree farmers across the country anticipate another busy season, and that could collide with recent supply challenges. Karen Kafa reports. Christmas trees are never far from John C. Underwood's mind. Surprising how many people do think that you put them in the ground in the spring and you're going to harvest them at, you know, November, December. It doesn't work that way. At our family farm, Pine Valley Christmas Trees, in the northeast corner of Maryland, the journey from planting seedlings in these fields to a family's living room is a long one. Once you plant them out, depending on the type of tree, it may take um, six to ten years before you have a saleable tree. From too much water to too little, to pests, a lot can happen. It also means farmers like Underwood can't simply ramp up supply when demand spikes. Because it takes seven to ten years uh, for your crop to uh, you know, mature, you don't have much choice about how many trees you can offer. More Americans stayed home for the holidays in 2020 because of the pandemic, so Christmas trees were in high demand. And some sellers found themselves short, a consequence of the Great Recession more than a decade ago that put a lot of farmers out of business. We were actually sold out on about the 3rd of December. We had another load of trees come in, and it was gone in a day and a half. In Southern California, Carl Holloway says he plants about 3,000 trees per year on the farm his father started in 1958. We grow a Monterey pine, which is a beautiful tree, but a lot of people would rather have what they grew up with as children. 
his crops, fighting challenges like California droughts. He brings in about half the trees he sells each year, mostly balsam and grand firs from the Pacific Northwest, where tree crops have also been hit hard by fires and extreme heat. In Oregon, for example, one of the country's top Christmas tree producers, farmers only cut and sold 3.44 million trees in 2020, down 27 percent from 2015, according to the USDA. And because of that, and because of labor shortages and other things, the price of the trees has gone up at least 100 percent in the last 10 years. All affecting Holloway's bottom line. But for both farmers, a hectic holiday season is family tradition. I love when our customers come in and they say, you know, my child was a baby when I first started coming here, and now they're bringing their children or their grandchildren. Those deep roots may be a reason to appreciate a tree a little bit more this year. In Elkton, Maryland, I'm Karen Kafa. Padre shortstop Fernando Tatis Jr. has racked up another Silver Slugger Award. The award is given to the best hitter in baseball, and he's won it twice in two years. Former Padres Tony Gwynn and Benito Santiago also won multiple Silver Sluggers. Tatis is also a finalist for Most Valuable Player. That award will be announced next week. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org. Thank you for joining us and have a great evening. Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, proud to support the mission of KPBS and privileged to serve San Diego clients. Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, helping homeowners maintain drain, heating and cooling systems since 1978 and by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. And by viewers like you, thank you.